The third case is a little bit more complicated, and this is Roz. Um, she's got the shopping list out, and she's the complex referral that we, again, often, often see. So she's had diabetes for six years, probably significant. She's diagnosed for six years, probably a lot longer than that. She has documented retinopathy. She's got stocking glove neuropathy. She's diagnosed with high blood pressure three years ago. We can probably imagine it was higher for longer than that. She, had, she has coronary artery disease. She had a drug eluting stent put in 2008. She has high cholesterol, peripheral arterial disease with two block claudication. She's got atrial fibrillation recently discovered restless legs at night, hypothyroidism, and she's a 30-pack year active smoker. And we laugh, but this is not an atypical case that we get on a weekly basis in my clinics, okay? So the reason for referral is diabetic nephropathy. She brings in an entire bag of medications, which I take down, but I know I have my trusty pharmacist to help me sort some of these things out. Down the road, she's got some allergies. Um, on review of systems, she's got some symptoms that are quite concerning from a nephrologist's perspective. She's had a five pound weight loss in two months. She says she's just not eating anymore. And I know she's had a history that likely she's had an appetite in the past, given her body habitus and diabetes history and so on. She's suddenly developed hypoglycemia. She said her sugars typically ran 10 to 15 before, and now she's actually going low quite often in the morning and so on, which is concerning. And reasons for that is likely her, her, her complication of CKD. Um, she is short of breath, which again, multifactorial. Is it lung, water in her lungs? Is it the fact that she's a 30-pack year smoker? Probably a combination of both. She's getting increasing edema, and she's just finding she's more and more lethargic in the last couple of months as well. She just can't get going during the day. Her blood pressure, she is significantly hypertensive. Her heart rate is well controlled. You saw she was on a beta blocker. Um, she's got a right carotid brewery. She's got some water, or some findings suggestive of water in her lungs. Her JVP is elevated, reduced per peripheral pulses, um, and just generally looks volume overloaded and, and short of breath. Her labs are interesting here. So her GP has been doing labs every year, in, not in an era of EGFR reporting. And as you can see, over the years, her creatinine's creeped up, but even some of the labs report up to 110, 115, creatinine's are normal. But her EGFR has dropped significantly in the last couple of years. And you can just sort of get a sense here of how GFR is a far more useful marker where you're seeing a creatinine of 120, and eh, not so bad, but you miss a year of screening and suddenly her GFR is down to 16 mils per minute, and we're quite concerned. Uh, also of note, her hemoglobin's quite low, her iron is quite low, her, she's been referred for colonoscopies and endoscopies and so on. And we can probably get into that as in chronic kidney disease, it's probably not necessarily um, nece uh, essential, especially when you're waiting nine months for these tests often. Um, I'll get into her labs as well, along with the interdisciplinary team. She had a kidney ultrasound showing bilateral echogenic kidneys and medical renal disease, which is often what we find in these types of people. Um, and I just want to highlight a few things here before I hand things over to my team. Um, is serum creatinine, as you can see from the trends there, is a very unreliable, nonlinear, and insensitive marker of kidney function, especially people progressing like this. EGFR improves understanding of level of kidney function, and hemoglobin abnormalities are quite common in chronic kidney disease. They don't phase us whatsoever in this type of situation. So they usually don't need intensive investigation unless they're not responding to iron or EPO replacement. 